Uh, thanks, Mike, for that wonderful introduction. Uh, and thanks on a wider scale to Mike, Paul, and everybody else who helped to set this thing up. Uh, another round of applause for them, although I'm sure they've had enough already. <laughs> so one thing that has struck me recently is just how much of a big deal my age is to people. Because I never really thought about it. You know, I was 19. That was my age. It was just the way things were. But when the BBC contacted me, they made a big deal out of the fact that I was young. When j for mb and A Voice for Men featured me, they mentioned that I was young. When Fabulous Magazine interviewed me, they mentioned that I was young. Why, even though I haven't done a great deal of speaking on the topic of youth engagement, was that the topic I was asked to present on? Well, it's quite simple. I'm weird. I'm an anomaly. <laughs> Most young people are not vocally involved in the men's movement, certainly not to the degree I am. And that is a danger to the movement. I often hear an argument from MRAs who are, quite rightly, a little annoyed, who say that we should just give up on the youth. They're untouchable. They're too indoctrinated. We can't win them over. Let's focus on those we can. But that's just not going to work. It's not true, firstly, but it's also not going to work. And so the aim of this speech is to enumerate, in as few words as possible, the two main obstacles to greater youth participation and try and lay out a few of my preferred solutions. So the first problem is ignorance and lack of awareness. People, and especially young people, just aren't aware of the men's issues. And this is because, as a young person, you won't have experienced most of these things. Any experience you have will likely be secondhand or filtered down through other people. You rely pretty much exclusively on other people telling you about these things and educating you on them. So as a result, it's not, un it's not uh, difficult to understand why so many young people are just not aware. Schools and other educational establishments do not talk about men's issues. Now, I have the benefit of being so young and having relatively recent experience of the formal education system. I'm still in university. Discussions of sexism throughout my school years were almost exclusively discussions of the many ways in which men have oppressed the poor women over the years, with no mention ever being made of the fact that men do suffer and sometimes women do bad things. When we learned about the suffragettes in my history class, there was much to do made of the fact that they campaigned for the right to women to vote. Very little was made, in fact nothing was made, of the fact that at the time they began campaigning, the vast majority of men also didn't have the vote. So I and most of the other kids, in fact probably all of us, left that class thinking that before Emmeline Pankhurst, all men were running roughshod across all women, which, as I'm sure you all know, just isn't accurate. The right to vote was restricted far more than just from women, but the suffering and oppression of the many men who also could not have a say in the way their country was run was not, a, apparently, a relevant enough topic for my history class. Now, I recall being given a leaflet in a lesson. It must have been PSHE or citizenship. And it was, you know, full of te text, statistics, uh, quite boring. It was on the subject of discrimination, and we were a class full of kids who didn't really want to be there, so none of us really read it in much detail. We looked at the headlines, at the bullet points, we read the comics and, and looked at the little pictures. And while it mentioned in the text of the document, in passing, that men could also be a victim of sexism or discrimination, the only examples that were given were those of women being oppressed and discriminated against. How could anybody be expected to come out of that classroom really being aware that men's issues existed? We were one step shy of being explicitly told that they didn't. My sixth form college had people on the gates on a number of occasions raising money for breast cancer charities. But I spoke to the head of the charities group at my uh, sixth form and I asked, are you planning to do one of these for prostate cancer or testicular cancer? And I was laughed out of the room. International Women's Day is celebrated across the world, particularly in schools, universities, and sixth form colleges. But when Mr. Um, Philip Davies MP raised the question of having one day, just one, in Parliament to discuss men's issues such as the four times higher male suicide rate, he was laughed at, he was abused, and once more, men's issues faded into the background, with no real progress being made. There's also an issue with the avenues for those who do seek help. If you feel that you've noticed a women's issue that needs to be addressed, where can you go? Well, start at the national level. Go to the Minister for Women and Equalities. But if that's not good, go up a bit. Go to the European Union Committee on Women's Rights, although I'm sure we can't do that now. And if that isn't good enough, well, why not go to UN Women? That's basically every country on Earth. Might be 
something to do with being chaired by Saudi Arabia at the moment, but moving on. There is no institutional apparatus or framework to call on when men suffer. And I've heard numerous times from people who say, well, if men's issues are a big issue, you know, all the men in parliament would be talking about them all the time. But this is obviously ridiculous. Government is not perfect. It can miss out some of the big issues. But this sends a very strong message that either these issues aren't there or they aren't worth addressing. Overall, our institutions either do not know or they just do not care about men's problems. And while many, by the time they reach 30 or 40, will have personally experienced these issues in enough detail that they are aware, young people haven't. And unless we fill those gaps that the institutions leave and we raise that awareness, well, then the young won't know about men's issues until it's far too late. Moving on from ignorance, there is also a very strong stigma. Being publicly pro-male and or anti-feminism can result in abuse, threats, and very harsh criticism. Another anecdote. In my second year of sixth form college, someone who I had a personal disagreement on on completely separate issues decided to, in effect, dox me. He posted my blog and my YouTube channel across uh, a Facebook page for my sixth form college uh, and added the message that this was a horrible, misogynistic views and should be challenged wherever possible. As a result, there were about 300 comments on that post threatening me, calling me every name under the sun, and personally abusing me. I had people telling me to watch my back in the hallways. Now, had you arrived at that page with little to no knowledge of men's issues, as most young people have, what you would have seen is me standing mostly alone, defending myself against a barrage of the worst abuse possible from a large number of students and ex-students who were still on the page. Even if you did agree with me on those issues, it's unlikely you'd have wanted to say so in public not to invite the same treatment. So this is why, although I did receive a large number of messages of support and people coming up to me in person to say they agreed, these were all private. The abuse was public. The support was private. And this has a really drastic effect because it makes the movement seem like a fringe minority of bitter old men. It makes it unsafe to support the movement, and it makes it seem unsafe. This is particularly damaging when it comes to young people because peer consensus is one of the most important deciding factors in the quality of your life as a young man. You don't get to choose who you're at school with. That's not an option you get to make. I was called a sexist in year 11 because I suggested after a conversation with my teacher that abortion law seemed odd to me. It gave women the unilateral right not only to decide if they became mothers, but also to decide if any man they slept with became a father. I never suggested anything about abortion being banned or restricted. All I did was raise the concern that once conception has happened, women have all the rights and men have none. But I was not allowed to say this. My teacher would not listen. She repeated her body, her choice, which is something I had agreed with and said myself. I wish I could say that I stood up and destroyed her with wit and the whole class stood up and started clapping, but of course, that's not what happened. <laughs> Instead, I stayed quiet. I was browbeaten into silence, but this was the last time I would let this happen. When men are punished... <laughs> When men are punished for raising their issues, men learn not to raise those issues, and their issues do not get addressed. One more anecdote. When I filmed for Tiger Takes On, the first BBC documentary, I filmed with Mike and Justice for Men and Boys, uh, on the grounds that they would not let me film independently. We were handing leaflets out outside of Nottingham University, and a number of students were coming past. One girl in particular came up and was just unleashing this barrage of hate at us. But I pulled it to the side. I said, no, come on, let's have an actual conversation. You know. I'm a good person, I'm sure you're a good person, let's have a good faith debate. And we did. And what was comical about it was that we didn't really disagree on much. We agreed that men had issues and so did women. We agreed that both should be addressed as much as possible. We agreed that there were radicals in the feminist movement giving it a bad name and making life harder for everybody. The only area in which we disagreed with any real force was that she argued that justice for men and boys, and Mike Buchanan in particular, was sexist. They could not give any examples, of course. No one can. But imagine if I, in an attempt to be liked, had taken on her advice. I'd not be here today. I would have lost any ability to talk about these issues 
and any ability to be heard when doing so. The accusation of sexism is more than enough these days to make someone lose their job, lose their place in education, lose their friends. At the very least, this will quiet people down, if not shut them up entirely. But I have some good news. The fight is not lost. The first thing we must know about this problem, and any given solutions to it, is that it's already beginning to solve itself. And in this, in a peculiar way, some feminists are actually our greatest allies. By forcing consent classes on male students, banning gay men from LGBT gatherings for male privilege, banning banter and loud culture and talking all day about toxic masculinity, it rankles with the average guy. The average man cannot take that demonization without standing up and fighting back. We don't like being told that we're scary potential rapists with toxic identities. And as the feminists continue to attack young men, and they continue to ignore their concerns, they drive more and more men to the point where there is nothing left to do but to fight back. Now, as to our actual approach to the problem, it has to be multifaceted. Firstly, we must deal with the ignorance. Now, the best way to do this is to do exactly what we are all here today to do. Raise the issues. Bring them up every time they're relevant and in the most public sphere you can get your hands on. The discussion of men's issues that resulted in Philip Davies's uh, abuse by Jess Phillips was pretty good, actually. There was a couple of articles in mainstream papers discussing International Men's Day and the men's issues that went with it. We have to make sure that we have more people like him willing to raise these issues in ways that cannot be ignored. We also need to make sure that when people present a one-sided view, we do not allow it to slide. It may well be used as an insult and a stick to beat us with, but we need to be willing to pop up and say, what about the men? When the media reports say that Boko Haram has kidnapped some girls and everyone's going nuts, we have to be there to say, well, yeah, they also firebombed loads of boys in their beds a little while ago, but obviously that wasn't worth reporting on. We cannot and we must not let people get away with presenting half of the truth and arguing that it is the whole. So what of the stigma? Because this is the stronger of the two issues, in my view. Well, firstly, it comes down to what we must do. We must be careful in our tone. The tone and the content and the rhetoric that we use in our videos, our talks, our articles must be checked and checked again. I do not seek censorship. I seek common sense. I seek remembering that everybody in the media is out to get us. We must be careful we do not give our enemies the ammunition that they need to further sweep men's issues under the rug. One example of this, when I filmed with Tiger Takes On, they read an excerpt from one of Mike's books. Now, this excerpt was a joke. It was lighthearted, and most people didn't really think it was that sexist, but all they showed was that one quote, out of context, and read while the music played ominously in a tone of voice that suggested it was far beyond the pale. And just like that, the narrative was set. Now, compare that to the narrative was used against me in the BBC Three documentary uh, Reggie Yates Extreme UK Men at War, which I had been told was going to be called Reggie UK. I was tarred as young, naive, and brainwashed. I was not a sexist, they were quick to say, but I was being misled by evil MRAs somewhere in the, the patriarchy's volcano lair. <laughs> The only thing they could find when they were looking to misrepresent me was that I kept tissues by the side of my bed and that I was living at home at the age of 18, like every other 18-year-old in Britain. Anonymity must be considered as well. We must not be afraid to show our faces and use our names. This stigmatizing tactic that is so often used relies on our fear. It is terrorism of the worst kind. And how do you stand up to that? You say, I will not be silenced, I will not be cowed, I will not be quieted. I will stand here until the day I am forced to stop, and I will bring these issues up, and I will never stop doing so. Now, having just finished my first year of university, luckily, I managed to skate under the radar somewhat. I received a first in my sociology and a 2-1 in politics. 
And I did so by being very, very careful in the arguments I made and the essays that I wrote. I managed to be publicly and openly pro-male without suffering for it. And the more of us that can do this, the more of us that manage to make it through without being harmed, the more of us that show that we are not scared of losing our jobs, we are not scared of the repercussions, we will not be silenced. And the more of us that manage to avoid being harmed, the more confidence that we can inspire in any young man or young woman who thinks they might want to look a little bit closer at the way gender works. If a young man or a young woman comes and sees an army of guys like us, names, faces, publicly aware, he's a lot less likely to be scared away. It makes it clear that this is not a fringe, this is not a tiny minority, this is an important issue, and there are people willing to say it. Philip Davies, when he spoke, mentioned that a couple of years ago in Parliament, he was the only person who would willingly stand up and say that we needed to leave the European Union. And he would have been tarred as a maniac for doing so. You can look at the experience of Nigel Farage to see the same thing. But what unifies people such as Mr. Davies and such as Mr. Farage is that they didn't care. They kept going. They kept talking. And now Nigel Farage has stepped down knowing that he has achieved the political goal he set out to. Regardless of your opinion on UKIP, you at least have to value him for that. By quieting down, not standing up, and not letting ourselves be counted, we ensure that firstly, those who may agree with us are unwilling to stick their heads above the parapet, and secondly, that we can be more easily painted as evil. After all, who has not heard? If you can't put your name to your views, you probably don't mean them anyway. When it comes to the media as well, I know that a lot of people are quite wary of, of participating. They know it's going to be a hit piece and they don't want to be part of that. But you must remember, you saying I'm not going to be in your documentary doesn't stop the documentary going ahead. It means they have to scrape the barrel a little bit more to get someone to misrepresent. The Reggie documentary had me in it, but it also had Roosh V, who, as I'm sure you're all aware, is not an MRA and has written many times on how much he hates us. Had I said to Richie, the casting director, that I didn't want to be in this documentary because I didn't trust the BBC not to misrepresent me, he wouldn't have gone, oh, well, looks like we're just not able to do it. He would have said, all right, looks like we're going to film more with Roosh. And that would have been worse because, OK, they showed some tissues by my bed. And OK, I live at home. But it's a lot better than having Roosh there talking all of the crap that Roosh talks. <laughs> we must be relevant and we must be resolute. The tiny fringe of extremists within the movement, and there are, as there are in any movement, must not be allowed to monopolize the media attention. If you are a moderate, if you are reasonable, if you know what you are talking about and you are going to do so with strength, passion and calmness, then you must stand up. I have done it, I will continue to do it, and I expect all of you to do the same. That way, we ensure that others, particularly the young, because as I say, peer consensus is so important to young people, do not have to fear being isolated in a tiny minority, but they can actually see that there are a lot of people talking about this stuff, and they're doing quite well. Now, we must remember that the vast majority of people are not actually that anti-male. They may believe themselves to be quite pro-male, in fact. The vast majority of conversations that I've had with young people, and young men in particular, have been generally positive. They know about these issues, as Sage said earlier, on a sentimental level. They have got some awareness that domestic violence against men isn't really taken seriously, some awareness that marriage laws aren't really that fair. They're kind of aware of these things, and what they need is someone to come in and make the case. Young people need to be educated on these things. Now, we also have to remember what it is that young people generally look for when they are choosing what political movement they will throw their weight behind. Young people want the new, the progressive. They want to stick two fingers up to the orthodoxies of their parents. They want to fight the power and back the underdog. And that's who we are. We are the underdog. We are fighting a huge institution of very powerful people with a lot of money. And we are doing quite well, actually, because the men's rights movement is new and it is progressive. We say screw you to the accepted wisdom. We have to make sure that we capitalize on that fact. And there are plenty of examples of groups elsewhere in the world that are doing the same thing with other issues. Generation Identitaire is an identitarian politics movement in Europe. 
they are currently engaging in a lot of direct action where they climb buildings and unfurl banners and the like. And they've got a great deal of youth support, even though identitarian politics and nationalist politics are not generally things the young like to get involved in. Donald Trump in America is doing the same thing. He's gaining quite a bit of young support from people who otherwise you would think wouldn't really want to talk. And the reason for this is because he has managed to portray himself, as Generational Identitaire has, and as basically every successful youth political movement in the past has, as anti-establishment. He is willing to stand up and fight for what he believes in and suffer for it. He has said to the media, continue to call me racist. I don't care because I know I'm not. And whether or not you agree with that, that is the strategy we must employ. Many people across the world have harnessed the political instincts of the young for years. It is time that we did the same. Now, I come towards the end of my talk and I realize that it's not quite as long as I thought it was going to be. But I want to end with an inspiring and positive message. Most people, and most young people in particular, are kind. They're moral. They want to see everybody living as happily and as freely as they possibly can. And as long as we stay here, and we remain steadfast, and we point out these facts, and we refuse to be silenced by those who would try, youth participation can only increase. Young men have had enough of being demonized, and young women don't like seeing that. Our job is to turn the youth's pre-existent distrust of authority, idealism, and empathy for their fellow man into actual rank and file support that can be counted on. Now, you all here today know this. That is why you are here. But it's our job now to take this message and send it into the wider world. Thank you. Yes, sir. Thanks. Um, thank you very much for coming along and reassuring us um, that not all young people have lost interest in politics. Um, um, a couple of things, really. Firstly, uh, about whether you've started a group within your university to bring men together in the way that some of the other speakers have suggested. And secondly, um, you said that most young people are not aware of these issues, uh, but I, I just wonder, because a lot, of, a lot of young people are growing up now in broken families and mm. they're not seeing their father. And one of my um, breakthroughs with young people has been uh, on the issue of contact with their dad and what happened and why, and whether they felt that was fair and so on. I wonder if you've had any experience in those sort of discussions as well. Okay, well, to answer your first question, I haven't set up any group, although I am currently looking into the prospect. I'm planning to spend, I spent the first year of university sort of acclimatizing, feeling out the society, feeling out the environment. The next year, I plan to spend feeling out the people, joining societies, joining groups, and attempting to see if there is any sort of receptiveness to a group of that sort. And if there is, I do plan on making some sort of move towards starting one. On to your second point, yes, fatherlessness is one of the issues that young people do experience as young people. I myself was not particularly close to my father until I was around 14 and it was only at that point that I realized just how important it was and just how much I had missed out. When speaking to young people, one issue that I've noticed on the issue of fatherlessness is that a lot of them have been quite manipulated by the women, by their mothers. And this is not a female trait, but this is the trait of anyone who would use the courts and use the state to manipulate another person and to harm them. These, these mothers have ripped their kids away from the fathers and then they have told the kids and filled the kids heads with all these lies and all these half truths about how much of a horrible man he was but i think young people are instinctively pro father they're instinctively pro both of their parents and as long as you make it clear that actually your dad probably didn't walk out on you he was probably forced out they believe it Okay, uh, well, thank you very much for this excellent speech, uh, of which I caught maybe 20%. Uh, so I have three questions. Uh, the first is, um, is there a way to, uh, for, for me to, to read that at, um, at the tenth of the speech you spoke? Um, I will be making the uh, full speech available online. Oh, that's great, thanks. <laughs> um, the second one, uh, wh what do you think is the best uh, topic or issue um, 
to, to start a conversation with young people? I generally go for suicide because it takes a very special kind of bad person to argue against more suicide prevention measures. <laughs> you really can't get away from it. You know, you say men kill themselves three, four times as often. No one can really respond to that with anything other than, oh, God, that's horrible. And once you've got that hook, you've got that first awareness, you can drive the point home. OK, thanks. And the third question is, um, uh, you mentioned uh, that you both have to, to have the courage or the balls to really stand up for what you, uh, well, what you stand up for. And on the other hand, uh, not screw it up by, by using crude language or whatever. And uh, this sounds uh, to me a bit hard to balance. Mm -hmm. And uh, what I'm a bit concerned about is that in an organization like mine, um, there are single individuals that start screwing the thing up by just mm -hmm. not being as much disciplined as that. Um, do you have any experience like that? Well, it, it's definitely a difficult balance to strike. And you're never going to be able to give the perfect answer to a media question because they are designed to trip you up. But when the Reggie documentary filmed me, they looked through all of my videos because they wanted to find something to use. And the only clip of my videos they played was one in which I said that one of the problems with our modern day discussion of rape is that we don't think about it in terms of facts, but only in emotions. That was the worst thing they could find on me. That was the worst thing I'd said. That was the most sexist thing on my entire channel. You've got to be careful and think about what you say. But that doesn't mean you have to sacrifice passion. It doesn't mean you have to sacrifice aggression. And it doesn't mean you have to sacrifice the substance. And as to the some individuals ruining it for everyone, that's going to happen no matter who you are, no matter where you are, no matter what you're talking about. What you have to do is make sure that the moderate voices are louder and make sure that you take every avenue offered to you to be a moderate voice. Thank you. Um, there's three things I wanted to uh, talk about. Um, when it came to the young people's awareness of the issues, I would say that, from my personal experience, they are aware, but they've been uh, tripped into thinking they're normal. Mm. So the whole absent fathers, uh, men not being counted as victims of rape, male suicide, that kind of stuff, they just see it as life. So it does take us going to them and saying, actually, hang on a second, no, it's not normality. This is actually a problem and we need to fix it. Um, and my second point was uh, when it comes to acquiring young people, I'm probably one of a slightly large handful of under 25s in here. Um, and I dare say one thing that underpins us all as a common factor would be uh, social media and mm. YouTube and the such like. Uh, I was brought in uh, through YouTube from watching videos. Spino as well could probably uh, agree to that. Um, so that's so where that. we can meet, yeah, and yourself. That's where we can meet young people is through social media and mm. through videos, which mm. I think is a very powerful tool in getting young people. Mm. And um, my third point was in response to what we said about uh, talk about male suicide to people, and everyone would go, oh god, that's terrible. Um, I'm going to actually disagree uh, because when I was at the University of York, when Martin Dorgan was talking there. We spoke to one of the women who signed the uh, petition oh, yeah. to not celebrate International Men's Day. And I said, hang on a second. They tried to have this petition because, uh, tried to have this uh, celebration of the day to recognize issues such as male suicide. You not see it kind of hypocritical. They said no to it uh, on the day that a male student took his life, to which she chastised me for bringing that up, saying it's completely irrelevant, and how dare I bring him into the conversation because he was completely irrelevant. The sheer apathy she had for his suicide and for his life was simply astounding. Some of these people do not care. Hmm. Some of these people do not care, but the vast majority do. One problem I have noticed when it comes to young people's awareness is that, yes, like you say, they either think these things are normal or they think that the correct avenue for addressing them is something different to the one we use. This is where it falls to us to point out the flaws in the other methods. This is where it comes to us to talk about feminism and to say, sometimes it does bad things. A lot of the time it does bad things. We have to not do those bad things. As to your point on social media, yeah, social media brought me in, YouTube. I make videos on YouTube. I'm going to make them even more in the future. And I think social media can be such a powerful tool because while one-to-one -one personal conversations are probably the best way to get a point across, online you have access to a much wider pool of people from a much wider area of the world. 
And so I absolutely encourage anybody with any social media to use it as much as they possibly can. Hey, um, I don't mean to be uh, promote paranoia or anything, but um, I, so I often see people talk about the extreme feminists, and then there's the kind that are just coffee shop feminists, as, as it were. Um, and your story about the the feminists that you spoke to um, that seem to agree, um, I would say be careful because I've met a lot of those kinds of feminists and you think oh it's okay they it's a positive thing they agree uh, on a lot more things but often it's it's just under the surface mm. and if you ask a few more questions you might find out they're not quite as nice as they might seem yeah um, there's there's certainly some some issue with that sorry you got um, to the, the name thing mm. about how you should you put your name out there and mm. um, like for some people it's just too much mm. for their jobs and everything yeah so um anyway i guess that's it really okay well i'll address the name point first yeah. yeah there are some people who it just would be far too risky but by and large it comes mm. down to tone again if you are a well-liked person who people know is not a sexist the accusations have a much harder time sticking you must use your name if you feel comfortable and if you feel safe to do so of course but I'm arguing that you are safer and you are more comfortable than you think. Especially as it is a cascading effect. The more people speak out, the harder it is to pick them out and fight them. Once we are a group, it is a lot harder to attack us than as individuals. On to your other point, yes, there are some who present a front of niceness behind which lurks actual misandry, but when it comes to young people especially, they haven't had the time to get these views so entrenched, so deeply held that it starts to twist who they are as people yet. Most of them are just misled. They have been manipulated and mistaught and lied to at every turn by everyone possible. And people don't like being lied to. So as soon as you can make them realize one issue, one, one area where they've been told a half truth or an untruth, that can very quickly start to change. Yeah, I've seen I've seen that kind of thing happen, but it's more of the attitude rather than mm. uh, ignorance of a certain uh, point that they believe. Mm -hmm. um, and so, once you get past that, you still have this general attitude, and you still think that they're quite diplomatic and that they're quite fair. But if you keep pushing and you keep trying to talk to them, you sort of notice that actually it's still. Actually, they're just saying there's like this middle ground they often don't mm -hmm. see and don't think about. And so when you meet these people, you might think they are much more on your side than they actually are. Just something to be aware of, I think. Yeah, I think the danger, however, is assuming bad faith in everybody. I, I go into it with somewhat a naive view. I go in assuming good faith. And so far, it's paid off. That's all I can say. That's all I can offer to you. Hi, Josh. Big fan oh, here. I want to thank you, uh, not just for your fabulous work on YouTube, but also for making pink dress shirts manly again. Anytime. What, if any, role do you see for young women, your peers, in the future men's rights movement, especially for young men? And do you feel like you need to tailor your message for them, and how would you do that? I think a certain amount of message tailoring is necessary because you always need to adjust whatever you're saying to the context and to the person you're addressing it to. Young women, I think, are empathetic. Young men are as well. When I have seen young men being demonized and mistreated, it is often young women who are some of their strongest defenders. Young women are not all corrupted and twisted, like many people think. When it comes to tailoring your message, I say focus first on the uncontroversial issues, the suicides, the circumcisions, the things of that nature, and also reinforce throughout that you are not anti-woman, you are anti-feminist, or not even that necessarily. And there are also many ways in which feminism hurts women. You talked about some of them yourself. Those can be a very useful tool for inviting some self-reflection, at the very least. Yeah, um, hello, Josh. Um, I think I'm not alone here in, in saying uh, you're an extraordinary young man, and we're very grateful to have you here. Thank you. Unfortunately, not everyone is as eloquent as you, 
And uh, in my own city of Portsmouth, there's a lot of, uh, of young men and women as well who don't go to university, who don't have the confidence to stand on a platform and speak up. They have feelings just the same as all of us have. Mm. And uh, I feel that sometimes um, our intellect, if you like, distances ourselves from representing those people who are hurting just as much, coming from broken homes mm. and struggling with poverty, jobs and all kinds of discrimination. Mm. Have you got anything to uh, suggest how we can help them? Well, certainly there are, you know, the manufacturing base of this country has been destroyed and the main uh, sufferers from that were men, particularly working class men. The same thing goes for our fishing industry and our agricultural industries, both of which have taken massive hits. Hopefully Brexit will do something to sort these out, but also you can make these points. Working class young men and working class young women are not unintelligent. They may be uneducated, but there is a huge distinction. They are just as capable, just as perceptive as the rest of us. They are just as aware. They are just as able to notice that something is up. And I think they are just as willing to stand up and fight it. And again, it re relies on tailoring your message. It relies on, on being able to talk to someone and understand what it is that drives them and fit your message to that, that driving force. As to general tactics, like I say, focus on things like the, the loss of manufacturing jobs. Focus on things like the demonization of particularly young black men. Uh, stop and frisk policies were mentioned earlier, uh, as are things such as predominant aggressive policies. Um, just a simple one. I asked a few people as a rhetorical question once. I said, guys, have you ever walked down the street and seen someone cross the road to avoid you? And they said, yeah. And I said, isn't that horrible? You know, uh, I, I, you can't go to a park as a man and if there are children around sometimes because, ooh, which one's yours? None of them? Yeah, you're a pedo. It's dangerous. And young men, working class men, working class adult men as well, know these things because they are in some ways the primary sufferers. Um, when I've spoken to young people at my school when I was back in sixth form, <laughs> I found that I ended up getting a lot more support, but then there was an actual, um, there was an action within that support. It yeah. was, yeah, I agree with you, and keep doing what you're doing, but don't get me involved. Yeah. So I think one of the things we need to really do is um, make it maybe more interesting to be involved with, mm. uh, because a lot of the a lot of the stuff can uh, appear to be boring politics. Yeah. And so maybe there needs to be more of a focus on making uh, making it sound more fun. Yeah, well, um, yeah, certainly. As I was talking with uh, Generation Identitaire, the Trump train, etc., um, it is exciting to fight the establishment. And as I say, if we focus very heavily on this anti-establishment going against years now of conventional wisdom and government manipulation and academic bias, we can make it seem as rebellious as people want it to be. Hi. Um, if someone were to compare you, say, with the young William Hague, would you feel pleased or insulted? I would feel extremely complimented, thank you very much. <laughs> Why is that? William Hague was a brilliant speaker at 16, whatever else you think of his political views. Thank you. Uh, hi, Josh. First, I want to also thank you for your great work. And um, more than a question, I have some comments. Um, uh, also, uh, about how you said we shouldn't be afraid of putting our names up there, you know, and and uh, I, 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 of course, agree, but I've also found that um, I've lost a lot of friends mm. just for being an MRA and anti-feminist. And I became an MRA when I was 22, still, still, still in college, and it was a very, very... Um, Marxist and feminist college, you know, and I have a social anxiety. So the only people I was comfortable uh, sharing my views with were my closest friends. 
you know, and they would always agree with me, you know, and we would have conversations and everything, especially my best friend from college. And he was by far the most intelligent uh, student I met while in college, you know. But I know for a fact that he would never uh, talk openly about any of those issues, like, yeah. ever, you know? I, I I know him, and I just know he would never do it. He, he only does it with me, mm. practically. Mm. And, you know, and I also lost the, the, the person I care for the most in my life because they wouldn't uh, they couldn't accept I am an MRA and an anti-feminist and uh, an inductivist. Mm. They couldn't just uh, 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 abide that, you know. Mm. And so I lost them, mm. yeah, and it, it, it also because I I admire Camille Salia, you know. Mm. <laughs> and, and they would be like, oh, I hate her, you know? Mm. And so eventually we just, well, they just got all contact with me. So, and also in my family, my mother uh, wants to, uh, I can talk about any of these issues, any, uh, around family, because. Uh, Especially because of my mother uh, and my father, but my mother the most. Mm. She once told me, uh, she she was screaming and you know, she, she told me, I'm I am tired of your misogyny. Mm. I'm sick of your misogyny, and I I've never said anything to misogyny, you know. Mm. I always well before I was an MRA, I was a feminist, and. Since I was 11 till now, I, I still talk against miso misogyny, you know, real misogyny now, before it was just nonsense. But now I also talk about real, um, against real misogyny, you know, and my mother was telling me, I'm, I'm sick of you, I can't stand you with it, I, I can't take your misogyny anymore, so I just can't say anything anymore. I understand. I personally have been very, very lucky. I've got two very supportive parents who would, you know, they'd support me in anything I did. And I've luck been lucky enough to be fairly popular when it comes to my own peers. And I think that has helped me massively in not being afraid. I have to say, though, that if someone would leave you and cut you out of their life for speaking up for the rights of men and boys, you're probably better off without them. Here, here. As hard as it often can be to speak out on these things for fear, that is where I think the older MRAs come in. You guys have a great deal more control over who you associate with than we do. You know, I didn't choose anybody in my flat in my first year of university. I chose the people I live in a house with now, but before that, that was not my choice. The people in my classes were not my choice. You have a much greater degree of freedom of association. You need to be the vanguard. Young people will not stand up if they don't see older people doing it first. Hi, Josh. Uh, as, I'm sorry, uh, as I'm sure you already know, there is a fair amount of data showing that the most hated upon demographic in this country is young white men, mm. and particularly young white working class boys, mm. who also have you know, the uh, lowest uh, success rate in the education system. On your point about making this look more rebellious, don't you think this particular fact drummed into the heads of young people would help? Certainly. Um, it's something that people pick up on. People are very perceptive, even if they don't realize it themselves. They pick up on the tone and the general response. And one thing I've noticed is that with a lot of guys, when you do treat them with respect and with, with care, and when you are there as a supporter as well as just, um, just, just there, as long, when you are there and you do offer them that support, a lot of them realize how hated they were before. They, they don't see it because it's just the way they've grown up. But once you show them there is another way, they are shocked.
And so I, I definitely think that reminding people of that fact incessantly and posting it everywhere and, and constantly mentioning it is important. And I think that a lot of white working class boys, as well as pretty much every other young man or, or white man, in fact, knows they're hated and knows that they can be hated and they are one of the last groups alive on earth that you can openly hate without being in trouble for it. Uh, th uh, thanks, Josh. We're, we're going to have to end the Q&A there. But ladies and gentlemen, Josh O'Brien.